So this will be the first of a trio talk. So after the break, you will have a talk by Alison and uh, Nick on the same question. So this is joint work with Alison and Nick, but I'm not saying it because you're going to see them in, uh, in half an hour. And I'm going to talk about a model which seems to be very well known in biology, but much less so in mathematics, which is called the infinitesimal model. So this model was introduced by uh, Fisher. in 1918. And since then, it has been uh, used by many people who don't necessarily say that they're using this model. So what does it say? It says that if you're interested in a trait, so phenotypic characteristic which is transmitted from parent to offspring, and if this trait is the result of a lot of tiny contributions from many genes, then the law of, if you know the trait of the parents, then the law of the trait of the offspring is a Gaussian random variable centered at the mean parental trait and with a variance which is independent of the parental trait. Okay, I'll write down later what the precise model is. But for now, uh, so it has been, it has occurred in the literature uh, since uh, well, quite a bit of time now, starting with uh, uh, people using it without actually saying they were using it. So Lush in uh, 37, who spoke about the breeder's equation, and Robertson in uh, uh, 66, if I'm not mistaken, and then later Bulmer and Lange. So these are the big names using the infinitesimal model, one way or another, in the 70s, let's say. But there's no clear formulation of what the model is, and up to my knowledge, there is no clear formulation of, of the conditions under which it, uh, it holds. And so that was the, the purpose of our work, to actually clarify the definition and the conditions under which you can use this infinitesimal model. So uh, more recently, it appeared in, uh, in the literature on uh, integral differential equations with work by uh, Vincent Calvez, Cepidemia and me, Gail Raoul and other people. Sorry for those I don't cite, like Jimmy Garnier, and, uh, Florian Patou, etc. So more in an infinite population framework, which I will not discuss much. But uh, so this model reappeared very, re very recently, and uh, it's going to be the focus of my talk. Okay. So my talk will be more about the basic. Uh, version of it, the additive version of it, and then Alison will speak about complications and Nick will speak about applications. Okay? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the plan. <laughs> okay. And of course, feel free to ask any question if you, if you have some. So what does it say? Suppose that you have a trait, your observed trait is the sum of a genetic part AL over L, so L is locus or a gene, yeah. plus an environmental noise in which you put everything which is not genetic. Okay. So this is the oh, environmental noise. This is the genetic part of the trait. With AL, be being the allelic effect of the else locus. Okay, and so this is the observed trait. For it's a complex trait, it could be the height, it could be the, the car of, I don't know, like the lifespan of an individual, it can be uh, many things. And so you decompose it this way, the sum of a genetic part and an environmental noise which will be common to everyone, or which will be, well, IID, but uh, in a sense not dependent of the, of the genes here. And so what we're aiming at is to show that at least this part here is a Gaussian, where the number of loci that contribute here is very big. This part is a Gaussian random variable 
centered at the mean parental uh, uh, trait, sorry, plus this noise here, okay? So for this, I will need a couple of, uh, of uh, oh, just a remark before, sorry. So here, if I write it this way, I suppose that there are no interactions between two loci, okay? I really look at one locust after the other. So I mean that there is no epistasis, and this is something that you can add. You can add the weak epistasis in the model. And if we consider diploid individuals, so carrying two copies of each allele, I'm also, so I will suppose that there is no interactions between the two alleles. There's no dominance, but Nick and Alison will speak more about dominance in the next talks. So I will really do the, like the simple exercise and I will leave all the complications to the, the two other talks or the other talk. Okay, so what does that mean? I will focus on this part here, mainly. And I will just assume that E follows a Gaussian distribution centered at zero and with uh, some variance. This is for convenience, more other noise would, uh, for simplicity. Because I'm expecting a Gaussian uh, contribution here, and so the sum of two independent Gaussians are easy to uh, write down. But uh, this is only for simplicity. What I really need for the proofs is that the, the density of this should be smooth so that it makes the whole density of the trait smooth it, it itself. But uh, that's the only requirement. So the assumptions now. I told you about the noise, now I will focus on the genetic part I will always assume that my individuals have two parents, but I will write down two cases. The haploid case is when everyone has only one copy of each uh, gene. And the diploid case, where everyone has two copies of each gene, so if I have two parents but only one copy of each genes, I will assume that this copy is the maternal or the paternal one with probability a half, okay? And there, if I have two, copy, two copies, I will inherit one from my mother, one from my father, and within the mother, it's chosen uniformly at random among the two copies of the mother and among the two copies of the father, okay? So this is gonna be Mendelian inheritance. So for the genetic part, I will assume that so Z, Z is not Z obs, you can observe, right? Z obs is really the trait that I see, if I pick an individual, I measure a trait, I see this, okay? So Z is gonna be the genetic part of it, only this sum here. I'll focus on this one for a while, okay? So Z, I'm gonna write it Z zero bar, plus one over square root of M, times the sum for L going from one to M, of eta L of chi L. It's a bit complicated as a notation, but it's because then we can generalize it uh, easily. And so what's all this? You see that there are M loci, or genes, with M is gonna tend to infinity soon. Okay. And then chi L is the state, the allele at locus L. And eta L is the allelic effect, okay? It's a function of the allele that you see at, uh, uh, at locus L. So allelic effect. <coughs> eta L, okay. So this is the haploid case, because you see that uh, each individual has, okay, has only uh, one allelic state, so this is the haploid. If I want to formulate a diploid version of it, which I put in red, if you, can you see in red? Is it okay? Yeah. So the same Z zero bar plus one over square root of M of uh, the sum over all loci of the two, the contribution of the two alleles because I have two copies of each gene, so chi L one plus eta L of chi L2. 
Okay, so this is the diploid version of it. So you see it's the additive uh, version because everything is additive, everything is added, and I have no interaction between these two copies here, and I have no interactions between the, the alias at different loci. Okay. Right. okay, so once I have this, it tells you that I have an average contribution plus terms plus allelic effects of order one over square root of m, and this will uh, fit into the uh, central limit theorem that I will give you uh, later. Yeah. So the order of magnitude of this, of the allelic effect at locus L, should be one over square root of m. Okay, so second, uh, second assumption now. What happens in my base population? So I will take a reference population that I will call t equals zero, and then I will propagate the trait from generation one to two to three, et cetera. So in the base population, the chi L, so I will, I will assume that the individuals are unrelated. They don't share common ancestors. And the chi Ls, their alleles at locus L, are taken uh, in an IID way from some di distribution chi L hat at locus L are independently drawn. So this is only to start somewhere. So, yeah. Drawn from a distribution of the low of some chi L hat. So this is a distribution of the law. This law, uh, the, the, the law of this thing uh, is a distribution in the base population, such that I want this to have mean zero. So the expectation of eta L of chi L hat should be zero. Okay. So that if you take the mean of this, you have m terms and divided by square root of m. If so, if it's not mean zero, there is no chance it converges to anything. Yeah. And the second requirement is that the variance should converge. And I assume that one over m times the sum of the variance of eta l of chi hat l. So the, if you look at this formula, everything is iid, so this is the variance of this term here from L going from one to M. I'm gonna write it sigma M squared here. This converges as M tends to infinity to sigma A squared. Sigma A, A like additive. So this is the haploid case. In the diploid case, I need the twice over M instead of one over M because I have twice these uh, contributions here. Okay. Right. So um, I think that's it. Now I need to tell you about Mendelian inheritance. So all these traits here, you know, in the base population, it's easy because everything is IID with your favorite local central limit theorem. You can get convergence of this sum here to a Gaussian distribution, okay? And so the challenge is to see how this is passed on from one generation to the next. And so I need to tell you how we model Mendelian inheritance uh, from generation t minus one to generation t. So for this, I will really assume that chi L over there is inherited from the mother or the father with probability a half, or in the diploid case, then each of these components, the first one is inherited from the mother, but from locus uh, uh, version one or two of the mother with probability a half, and the same in the father. Okay. So for inheritance, I will need a sequence of Bernoulli random variables. So let xi, uh, one, and yi, uh, yes, I should write L, sorry. Because this is gonna be for loci. Uh, B2 sequences of independent, B2 independent, sequences of IID 
so independent and identically distributed Bernoulli random variables with probability half. So zero or one with probability, each with probability a half. Okay. And so in the first case, in the haploid case, you can write down Z, so the trait, the genetic part of the trait, Zj, for individual J, with parents labeled J of one and J of two. Okay, so these are gonna be the labels of the two parents. If I need to call the, the parents, I call them J of one and J of two. So the genetic trait of my individual can be written like Z bar zero plus one over square root of M times the sum over loci of, so what I, I told you with probability a half, or when this is equal to one, I inherit the chi L here from the mother, and with uh, the, uh, the indicator function that is gonna be inherited from the father will be one minus XL, okay? So how do you write this? You write this as the indicator function that it was maternally inherited times eta L of chi L for the mother, J of one, say. So with this indicator function that it is maternally inherited, the contribution chi L over there comes from the mother. And with the complement, so one minus chi L, it comes from the father, eta L of chi L J of two. Okay, everyone happy with this? I, I decide whether it comes from the mother or from the father. This is one, mean that this is zero, and if this is zero, this is one, okay? Right, and now if I try to see what it's gonna give now, then I can always write it as z bar plus one over square root of m. So this is this has mean a half. The probability that it is inherited from the mother is a half. So if I replace this by a half, and then I correct to get a zero mean noise, what I get is one over, so the two comes here. I have the sum for l going from one to m of um, a half, so a half of this, plus the parental KLJ of two. Okay, so I'm just replacing this and this by their mean, a half. And then I need to write what remains, and what remains is one over square root of M. The two is not here because it was just a, a half, which was here and here, times the sum. I'm just trying to show you where we're going. So XL minus a half, eta L of chi L J of one, plus one minus X L minus a half, so a half minus X L, times the contribution from the father, from the second parent. Yes, this is it. And if you look at what I got here, I got the average parental trait, okay? plus a term which has mean zero because Mendelian inheritance here what makes it have mean zero and a given variance that I will explore now. Okay. So this I can always write it as, so Zg is Zj of one plus Zj of two divided by two plus a term Rg, this is Rg, okay. This term here is the remaining term. This is Rg, which is mean zero. With a certain variance. Okay. 
And if I want to do that in the deep fluid case, you do exactly the same, except that now you need to have the indicator function for the maternal trait, which is inherited here, and the paternal trait inherited here. And so what you get is, in the deep fluid case, Zj is again the half of uh, the parental trait divided by two, plus another term, which is this one, Uh, with uh, Rg is now one over square root of m. I'll give you only the, the beginning of it. So the sum of chi L to xL minus a half eta L of, so I have two copies now, so I need L1 of the first parent, the same with the second locus, uh, the second allele of, this, the, of the first parent, et cetera, and the, the last one is one minus, one half minus YL times eta L of, sorry if it's tiny, but I want to keep it later. So the second allele of the second parent. Not sure this is really visible from the, like the, the back, but it's exactly the same kind of term here, except that you have two more terms with the y's because you have noise on inheritance within the mother and within the father. Okay. But in both cases, you can always uh, write it as the average, the mid parent uh, trait plus a noise which has mean zero and then some behavior as m tends to infinity. Right, and now the result is the following. So I've told you only about the genetic component, but you can extend it. So the theorem, so conditionally on knowing the pedigree up to generation T, I will explain just after. And all the ancestral traits, the observed ones, up to generation T minus one. Okay, so if I suppose that I know the ancestral relationships between individuals between generation zero and T, I know who's the parent, who's the parent of whom, okay? And I'm allowing selfing, so I could have the mother and the father being the same here. It's not a problem. So if I know all the ancestral relationships up to generation T, sorry, and all the all the traits of everyone, all the observed traits of everyone until generation T minus one. So if I get a lot of information of, on the parental traits and the ancestral traits, okay. even then the distribution of this, the vector of traits that I observe in generation T is multivariate Gaussian centered at the mean of the parents of each individual and with the variance which is independent of parental traits. So even if I accumulate as much information as I can, the infinitesimal model tells you that the trait in the, in the brotherhood will not depend, uh, well, the, only the mean will depend on the parental trait and the variance will not depend on the parental trait. So uh, conditionally on all this, then the vector of, so this is true only for the gene, oh. So I will phrase the theorem for the genetic part, the one that I analyzed over there, uh, the genetic part of the uh, trait of the anti individuals in generation T forms, uh, converges as M tends to infinity to a Gaussian vector, pass, to a vector of independent Gaussian
random variables with mean uh, centered at the average parental trait and with variance So sigma a squared, which was the limit of the partial variances over there, okay, times one minus the probability of identity by descent between the two parents. So what I write, f j of one, j of two, it's the probability that if you pick one allele in the individual one and one allele in parent two, then they, uh, they, they are identical because they were inherited from the same ancestor. Okay. So where f i i prime, prime is the probability of identity by descent, so the fact that you have the same allele inherited from a common ancestor, Descent uh, between a gene taken in I in a given locus taken in I and one taken in I prime. So that's the result. You see that this is really independent, so the variance is independent of the parental trait, and the more, uh, the more uh, likely the parents are identical by descent, the smaller the variance within the family. Okay? So what it does not tell you is that within the whole population, the distribution is Gaussian. Okay? You may pick the two parents in a fancy way because of selection, which would make the whole distribution of the trait in the population non-Gaussian. But if you fix the parental traits and look at what happens in their uh, offspring, then the distribution is Gaussian. Yep. So the proof actually tells you more than this, and I will end with this because I'm, I don't know, five minutes, well. <laughs> okay, less than five minutes. Uh, one small remark, uh, and in, in particular in these works here, this, this result or this model is used in an infinite population, which means that the FII prime is always zero. You suppose that people are unrelated, they cannot share common, ancest uh, common ancestors over the time scale that you consider at least, and so the variance is actually constant. It does not get eroded by uh, having common ancestors. Right, so the proof uses a central limit theorem, a local central limit theorem that tells you that the, the limit of the genetic contribution here is, uh, uh, well, the limit of Rj here is Gaussian. And if you want to ad identify the variance, the limiting variance, you have to prove that even though you know the sum of all these contributions here, it doesn't tell you much about one AL. Okay, so if I gave you the sum of, uh, of uh, one million uh, IID random variables, I tell you after random walk, after one million uh, jumps in a random walk, you are at position 1,000. You can't tell me what was the first jump, okay? Because there are so many combinations of jumps that may have led to the actual result that you cannot actually know what is the distribution of the first jump. So it doesn't tell you much to know the sum because the number of alleles tends to infinity. And the correction to that is of the order of one over square root of m. And so when you compute the variance, it all disappears in the limit, essentially. Okay. So the proof tells more than this. It gives you a speed of convergence, which is very useful to know uh, how long the model is valid, say. So it tells more than this. For M large enough, and for every uh, J in the generation, 
So if you look at an individual J in generation T, you can formulate it more generally, but just say you pick one individual in generation T and you want to know how well its trait is approximated by this normal distribution here, then uh, for every Y in R, we have the difference between the probability that, so the trait, the, other, the, the, the genetic part of the trait of this JST individual minus the average parental trait divided by sigma n squared, the sigma n squared, which is over there, times one minus F G of one, J of two, square root of that, sorry. So if you compare the probability distribution function of this to that of a normal distribution, this is bounded by T, the generation over which, the number of generations over which you have been accumulating errors, divided by square root of M, times a function which is explicit, but I'm not gonna write it, of two quantities, sigma t and delta t, where sigma t is the minimal within family variance observed until time t. up to generation T. So you observe all, your fam all of the variants in your family and you take the minimal, uh, the minimal value of it. Okay. And uh, delta T is the maximal displacement compared to the, the parental mean, so it's the max of the trait, or the, of the genetic trait of the individual minus the average, the parental average over two. So again, the max over j is not the j prime. Okay, so it the, the, the error that you make, so you see that the error is of the order one of square root of m, which tends to uh, say that the infinitesimal model will be valid for of the order of square root of m generations before it breaks down. And the second information is that if this minimal variance within a family becomes too small because there's a lot of inbreeding, then the error deteriorates a lot. And if, the, if one of the tra traits is too extreme compared to the average parental trait, the bound de deteriorates also. Okay, so in the end, this model will be valid if the variance of inheritance within the family is not too small, or there's no chance that it becomes too small, and if the trait is not too extreme, because if you know that the trait is very extreme, then you know much more about each small contribution here, okay? If I told you that after your random walk, you're at position uh, one million, you know that every step had to be one, and so you know much more about the, each member of the, uh, of the sum there, okay? And, and I will stop here because you're gonna have many more after the break.